Hello. In this quick video, I want to give a short overview on the philosophical debate that concerns free will and determinism, and present some of the details of one of the arguments by Peter Van Inwagen. Okay, so let's just jump right into it. First of all, what is free will? Well, very roughly, having free will means that you have the ability to choose your future actions. It's your capacity to take control over what you do in the future. So suppose, for example, that you're right now deliberating whether to major in philosophy or major in business. If you have freedom of the will, then that means that it is open to you to choose either one of these options. Um, you have it in your power to choose which major to take. And once you have chosen, you are then responsible for the decision that you made. One of the long-standing issues when it comes to free will concerns its relation to the thesis of determinism. Uh, here's uh, Peter Van Inwagen's definition of the concept of determinism. He says, Determinism is the thesis that it is true at every moment that the way things then are determines a unique future that only one of the alternative futures that may exist relative to a given moment is a physically possible continuation of the state of things at that moment. In other words, determinism means that given the initial conditions of the universe and the laws of physics, there is only one physically possible future. So for example, whether you end up majoring in philosophy or business is already settled. The state of the physical world right now, along with how the laws of physics are, will determine which state will evolve from the present. It's already determined whether you major in philosophy or business, or whatever else. So now that we have the two central concepts of the free will debate, the concept of free will and the concept of determinism, we can now go on to tackle uh, the central issue um, that concerns people about free will. And this issue is whether free will is compatible with determinism. There are two positions that one could take on this question. The first position is called incompatibilism. This view claims that free will and determinism are incompatible. If the universe is deterministic, then there is no free will. Um, there are generally two kinds of incompatibilist views that occur within the free will debate. Uh, they are called hard determinism and libertarianism. A hard determinist is someone who holds that one, determinism is true, two, that free will is incompatible with determinism, and so three, there is no free will. A libertarian, on the other hand, is someone who holds that one, free will is incompatible with determinism, but two, free will exists, and so three, determinism is false. Lastly, there's one more position which one could take, which is that free will is compatible with determinism. This position is called compatibilism. Generally, a compatibilist will likely hold that free will exists and that free will can exist whether or not determinism is true. Free will is compatible with the truth of determinism. So now that we have the lay of the landscape in this free will debate, I'm going to now present one of the very prominent arguments uh, for incompatibilism. This argument is called the consequence argument, and it's most notably advocated by Peter Van Inwagen. So first of all, here's a very general outline of how the argument goes. Premise one, free will requires the ability to do otherwise. If I say, freely lift my right hand right now, that it must have been possible for me to refrain from lifting my hand. I must have had the ability to, to keep my hand by my side. If determinism is true, premise two, then I would not have the ability to refrain from lifting my hand. Therefore, if determinism is true, 
then, it, then I did not freely lift my right hand. This is a valid argument. So in order for the argument to be sound, both of its premises must be true. And within Van Inwagen's paper, he's concerned to defend the second premise. He wants to defend the, the claim that if determinism is true, then I would not have the ability to refrain from lifting my hand. So here's how he argues this. The first thing that he does is he defines a couple concepts. And the first one is that he defines the concept of an untouchable fact. An untouchable fact, according to his definition, is one that it is not within our power to change. We do not have the ability to change the untouchable facts. Um, he, he lists, for example, that we do not have the ability to change the truths of arithmetic or the law of gravity or the other laws of physics or um, the fact that there used to be dinosaurs in the past. All of these facts are untouchable for us. We have, no matter what we do, we could not change them. In general, um, if P is an untouchable fact, let's symbolize this as a uh, capital U and then in brackets P. Okay, so next Van Inwagen proposes a principle and he calls it the principle. Here's what he says. Suppose that it's an untouchable fact that P, and suppose also that the following conditional, i.e. if-then statement, expresses an untouchable fact. If P, then Q. It follows from these two suppositions that it's an untouchable fact that Q. Uh, we can, um, we can symbolize this principle a little bit more succinctly by by writing it as if u p and u if then p or if p then q then u q. Van Inwagen thinks that this principle should be accepted as true. He thinks that this is a very plausible and intuitive principle. Once he has these two pieces in place, he then offers the following argument. Um, we call this the, the consequence argument. Let P express the facts about how things were before the time of my birth. Um, P has to express all of the, the states of affairs that, uh, that occurred um, before I was born at some time. According to determinism, if P, then I will raise my hand right now. Um, it's determined that I raise my hand given how things were in the law of physics. Moreover, if P, then I raise my hand right now would be an untouchable fact. I cannot do anything to change the laws of physics. Secondly, P, the, the facts about how things were in the past, is also an untouchable fact. Therefore, according to determinism, it is an untouchable fact that I will raise my hand right now. This just follows from premise uh, one and two and the principle that Van Inwagen calls the principle. Um, we can express this argument a bit more succinctly if we use the symbolization that I introduced earlier. Here's how it would go. Let's let H express the fact that I raised my hand right now. Then premise one says that according to determinism, U, if P, then H. Premise two says U, P. Uh, and then the conclusion then is that according to determinism, U, H. Basically, according to determinism, it's an untouchable fact that uh, the past entails that I, that I raise my hand right now. That's given by the laws of physics. It's an untouchable fact how, um, the, that states how the past was before before I was born, so it follows from the principle that according to determinism, it's an untouchable fact that I raise my hand right now. Um, there's nothing I could do uh, that would give me the ability to keep my hand by my side. I'm, I didn't have the ability to refrain from raising my hand. Um, I must have raised my hand right now. Can we put this argument into any plainer English? Maybe. How's this for a, um, a more 
plain representation of this argument. You cannot change the past, but according to determinism, the past determines the future according to the laws of physics, which you also cannot change. Therefore, according to determinism, you cannot change the future. Okay, so that's the consequence argument by Peter Van Inwagen. It's an argument for the incompatibility of determinism and free will. It also seems like a very powerful argument, doesn't it? Um, it doesn't seem like it would be all that easy for a compatibilist to respond to it. Um, so I'm just going to leave the argument as it is. I'm not going to go into the details of how a compatibilist would respond, but let me just close by mentioning a few ways in which compatibilists have attempted to respond to this argument. I'm just going to mention these. I'm not going to really explain them. So first of all, the whole validity of this argument rests on whether this thing that Van Inwagen calls the principle is true. And in fact, some philosophers have challenged the truth of that principle, but the discussions of this can get very technical. Secondly, the first premise of the, the basic argument claimed that in order to have free will, you must have the ability to do otherwise. But the philosopher Harry Frankfurt famously challenged the idea that the ability to do otherwise is necessary for free will in the sense of free will that's relevant to moral responsibility. Frankfurt attempts to devise counterexamples to this definition of free will. Examples where um, agents didn't have the ability to do otherwise, even though they're morally responsible for their actions. And this then spurred on a cottage, cottage industry of objections and replies. And this became a really huge debate. Lastly, the philosopher David Lewis challenged the claim that the facts of the past or the laws of physics are really untouchable in the sense that's needed for the argument to work. Lewis agrees that I don't have the ability to change the past, to cause the past to be any different, or the ability to break the laws of physics. But still, he says, I'm able to perform actions that are such that, were I to do them, the past would have been different, or were I to do them, then the laws of physics would be different. Right now, I have the ability to keep my hand by my side, says Lewis. Um, my doing this, my keeping my hands by my side, is not breaking any law of physics, and it's not, it doesn't constitute a, um, a cause of, cause an alteration in the facts of the past. But if I were to keep my hands by my side, then the past would have been different or the laws of physics would have been different. But that's not the same as breaking the laws of physics or causing the past to be different. Anyway, so that's how Lewis responds to the argument. Again, I'm not going to go very much into the details of these responses. I just wanted to present them so that you have a list of, of possible replies that the compatibilist has, uh, has attempted to use. Okay. Um, that's all that's all for now. Hope I hope that this video was helpful.